All right, good evening, ladies and gents. Welcome back to Compound Interesting. This is Emil, and as you can see, we're diving into my computer today. I prepared a couple of quick slides for you, uh, the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum and their proof of work, their consensus models. So there's proof of work for Bitcoin and proof of stake. So firstly, I probably should describe the differences. Well, what are proof of work and proof of stake? But I'm not gonna go too deep into the weeds of the technicals. We mostly wanna talk about which one is better because both, both of them have advantages and disadvantages but one of them is better in my opinion uh, as far as I've as far as the depth of research that I've put in and so with all that said if you wouldn't mind quickly hitting the thumbs up button it really helps the small channel like me and subscribing if you're new and hit the notification bell if you actually want to see my videos because I'm not really playing to the YouTube algorithm I just put up videos when I can and um, so this is going to be an interesting one so let's first dive into the differences so proof of work what is proof of work in proof of work we have miners so these are people with really powerful computers who are mining, which means they're solving complex mathematical equations. So first they have to put in an investment to buy the computer equipment, and then they have to put in a large investment of electricity costs to validate the transactions. Okay, so both models require you to put in some sort of investment, either electricity, money, or uh, computing power. You need to put in some sort of investment if you want to validate transactions, and that's, how th that's what consensus means where all the miners come to consensus and agree on the transactions that have gone. So if, if there was no investment required, if I wanted to just put in fake transactions, there's no disincentive for me. But if I put in money, if everyone's put in money and my, my transactions, my fake transactions aren't going through, then I've lost the money that I put in. So that's why there is a requirement for investment in both models and to actually to be able to come to a consensus in a decentralized manner. Both both systems require that. With Bitcoin, so the proof of work model, the investment that you have to put in is computing power. So you have to buy all these really powerful supercomputers which mine for Bitcoin. So they're basically solving complex mathematical equations just basically to proof of work. It doesn't really do anything apart from showing that you've actually put in some sort of investment but in proof of work the bitcoin model whoever puts in the most hash power and electricity is the most likely to get the bitcoin reward and yeah over time you're going to get a bitcoin reward for putting in electricity both electricity costs investment in electricity and computer equipment whereas in proof of stake you don't have to buy equipment anymore well you won't have to buy equipment anymore once ethereum moves to proof of stake fully and um, all you have to do is stake your Ethereum. So you just have to risk your Ethereum. You don't have to put in any other investment. So this also dis disincentivizes you from you know, putting in fake transactions or trying to gain the system at all. We'll get further into that. So that's the two different ways that these cryptos come to consensus. So if you were to try and attack the system with proof of work, you need to get 51% of the hash power. Whereas with proof of stake, you need to have 51% of the total Ethereum stake staked to actually cheat the system or to you know double spend to put a, a fake transactions through. All right, so here's where things get interesting. The security differences between proof of work versus proof of stake. Right, I always thought that proof of work being Bitcoin's one, having the largest computer network in the world, the most hash power in the entire world. Of course, Bitcoin is gonna have the most secure network in the entire world. Uh, to 51% attack it, you have to have 51% of the hash power of the biggest computer network in the world. Seems pretty difficult. And then I listened to a podcast with Justin Drake, one of the Ethereum Foundation uh, developers, and he kind of opened up my mind to the actual advantages to proof of stake. So let's get into them now. So as you can see from the first point there, Ethereum has a higher percentage uh, compared to the market cap going to securing the network than Bitcoin does. So a higher percentage of the total market cap of Ethereum is going towards actually securing the network. and the, that, well, that will be the case once Ethereum moves to proof of stake, and that can only, well, it can, it, it mostly can only be done in a proof of stake model. So let's break that down. So to attack the Bitcoin network, we would need to get 51% of the hash power, so the computing power and electricity that the Bitcoin network currently has. Um, so let's just assume, well, let's not assume the average estimate of the total investment into mining equipment. Uh, for the Bitcoin network, just for the Bitcoin network, is $10 billion. So that's how much all the mining equipment costs to secure the, the, all the mining equipment that's currently being used to secure the Bitcoin network is $10 billion. That's how much it cost in the first place. So obviously we can't really buy that straight, straight from them. So we can't just say, oh, we'll buy 
5.1 billion of mining equipment and then we'll have 51% because they're not probably not going to sell it so we're actually going to have to buy 10.1 billion of mining equipment to be able to have more hash power than than the current miners have so if we put in an investment of 10.1 billion let's just say 10 billion for just to make it easy so we have to put in a 10 billion dollar investment plus a load of electricity costs to be able to 51 percent attack the bitcoin network now let's just say for simplicity even though it's not true that bitcoin is currently worth one trillion dollars so that would mean 10 billion dollars is securing one trillion dollars worth of value so if you want to attack the bitcoin network you would only have to put in 10 billion dollars plus electricity to attack one trillion dollars of value so so just over one percent of the entire market cap of bitcoin is gone to security in that in that sense so that's the amount that someone would need to spend to be able to attack the bitcoin network theoretically now whereas when we move to ethereum the the estimate of the amount of ethereum that should be staked is 30 percent so 30 percent of the ethereum of the ethereum floating around the world uh, is likely to be staked and that's just from estimates because they have uh, a mechanism whereas if there's not enough people staking then they increase the percentage that you'll get in rewards and vice versa if too little people are staking or if there's too many people staking they'll decrease it so they estimate Justin Drake estimates that 30% of the entire Ethereum supply will be staked so that's kind of easy to work out 30% versus 1% of the market cap it's gone to will be gone to securing ethereum so and that's also way more in monetary terms as well ethereum's worth about half a billion dollars today so to be able to attack ethereum you need to get 15 percent of the supply so that's 30 billion dollars sorry sorry 15 sorry 50 billion dollars so 50 billion dollars it's actually even more in monetary terms and not just percentage terms where you need 50 billion dollars to 51% attack the ethereum supply uh, theoretically again now some of you might be thinking okay it's not going to be that simple I, I need more than just money to be able to attack Bitcoin and to attack ethereum well not is it necessarily ethereum but to attack Bitcoin it's not as easy to just buy 10 billion dollars worth of supercomputers and because like there there's a limited supply of them there's a really limited supply of them they're hard to get your hands on so you'd probably need to spend a fortune much more than the going rate uh, that those people already bought for them and furthermore people would see that you're trying to buy loads of miners and probably work out that you're trying to attack the bitcoin network and then they would also try and buy up other miners so unless you were able to get some sort of supercomputer that was 10x or 100x better than what's going on the market which is unlikely or maybe you have a quantum computer or something then it's going to be very very difficult for you to actually uh, acquire 51 percent of the hash power in the world Similarly with Ethereum, it's not as easy as just buying $50 billion worth of Ethereum. It's kind of hard to gather $50 billion worth of Ethereum without making the price increase so much. So if you bought $5 billion of Ethereum, it'd send the price up by 50%. And as you keep buying, the price is going to keep going up and up and up. So it'd be very, very difficult for you to acquire that much Ethereum. All right, so the next point, Ethereum has this will have this new mechanism called slashing. So when you're validating transactions you've put your ethereum up you've staked your ethereum so you risk it to the ethereum network so you don't own that ethereum anymore but you're getting but you're getting rewards in eth for securing the network and validating transactions or whatever but if as a validator you're doing any sort of file play if you're doing trying to sign two different transactions or trying to do any other kind of you know stuff you're not supposed to be doing uh, the ethereum network can slash your your stake so you stake your ethereum and if someone if a different validator sees that you're trying to game the system or cheat the system and they say it to the network they say it to the blockchain they'll they will get the slashing reward so if you're trying to do some sort of cheating thing if you're trying to get if you're trying to benefit yourself somehow in not a fair way then your ethereum will get slashed i.e like some of the ethereum that you staked will go to the person who reported you so this kind of incentivizes people incentivizes the validators to all check everyone else is playing fair and report anyone who's not playing fair because if they do they'll get rewarded for it and this is this incentivizes anyone to not play fair so that's a nice little mechanism that ethereum 2 will be bringing out slashing obviously the big advantage or 
obviously one of the big advantages to Ethereum as well is the energy. Like that, everyone knows that the energy debate is going crazy. Uh, not, I'm not too worried about the energy usage of Bitcoin. I think it's a, a good use of energy. However, Ethereum will use obviously a lot less energy because there's no electricity costs really being required to validate transactions ever, anymore. All their all that's required is people to stake their Ethereum. Whereas in Bitcoin, a lot of electricity needs to be expended to secure the network. So that's one advantage for Ethereum. Now, the thing that Bitcoiners would argue is that Ethereum is kind of similar, well, the proof of stake system is kind of similar to the current system in whoever has the most money has the most power. And with Bitcoin, it's whoever, like it's more of a capitalistic idea. It's like whoever is the most useful to the network has the most power, i.e. whoever can get the cheapest electricity, whoever can be resourceful and work out how to make a better supercomputer has the most power, as opposed to just whoever has the most money has the most power. But at the same time, I kind of thought to myself like, all right, yeah, but at the same time, if you have more money, you're more likely to be able to get a better supercomputer. And if you have more money, you're more likely to be able to travel to find the cheapest electricity. So. Uh, to me, it's not like the strongest argument. So again, I'd love to hear uh, a Bitcoiner's side of view, point of view on this matter, because I've already heard hear, heard the Ethereum point of view about security and energy and all, all proof of stake versus proof of work. So yeah, for me, proof of stake seems like a better model at the moment, but I'm definitely open-minded to hearing a uh, proof of work side, side of things. So tell me why I'm wrong, tell me why proof of work is better in the comments or if there's anyone who wants to even come on, on my channel who's an expert on this, let me know in the comments and yeah, I'll, I'll try and reach out to someone and get, maybe get a bit of a, get a bit more insight into that. So I want to kind of open your mind up to the differences between proof of stake and proof of work and potentially why proof of stake, kind of open your mind to why proof of stake might actually be quite secure and why it might actually be better than proof of work. <coughs> Because my, my mind was kind of blown when I listened to that podcast. I listened to Justin Drake for a while and he kind of blew my mind to actually, oh, wait a second, maybe proof of work isn't the best model. Maybe it isn't the most secure, uh, but at the end of the day, they're both really, really secure and they're both really, really good and they both have the disadvantages and advantages. So if you learned anything, please smash the thumbs up button. Subscribe if you want more crypto and stock related content, just basically investing content. Uh, I will be going back to stocks once the crypto bull run is over, I'm sure. So hang around if you're in, interested in both stocks and crypto, because I'm interested in both myself. Right, I really hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something, and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.